Lois from Adult Education at Arch Street Meeting, Quaker, Philadelphia. I'm here to introduce Sean Connolly, the Executive Director of the Arch Street Meeting House Preservation Trust. He'll be talking to us and answering questions for the rest of the evening. Thanks so much, Lois, and a pleasure, pleasure to be presenting uh, to you all this evening. Uh, so Lois asked me to do kind of just a broad presentation on what the Arch Street Meeting House Preservation Trust is. It's a mouthful. Uh, and what we're responsible for, and then answer any of the questions that uh, you all might, uh, might have. I guess the first question is, will I be able to share my screen? And can everyone see that? Okay. Uh, all right, so the uh, our shoot meeting house. This is our logo. Always try and start off with that. I just thought I'd review some of like the basic history, which kind of explains how we got to the our shoot meeting house preservation trust in the first place. Uh, obviously, the burial ground uh, existed well before the meeting house, uh, and to a certain extent, almost before the the meeting itself. Uh, burials began uh, as early as 1687. Uh, on this exact property, uh, but it was formally deeded in 1701 uh, by William Penn as a place for burials um, and sort of for the precursor of the Philadelphia uh, monthly meeting, Philadelphia yearly meeting served those purposes. Served that purpose for much of the next hundred plus years, uh, but you can see sprinkled throughout the minutes of the Philadelphia monthly meeting, the quarterly meeting, the yearly meeting, that they intended to build something um, eventually uh, on this property. Um, and so it, it's not until 1803 that it officially gets to go ahead and of course the meeting house is constructed to house uh, a monthly meeting, a quarterly meeting, and of course the yearly meeting. Here are just some pictures of, of things happening in the middle of the 19th century. Um, this is uh, both pictures um, are uh, in either the east or west room. You can see here, this is uh, part of continuing sessions, I believe. And then uh, this picture on the right is actually from uh, when the building was used by AFSC to, to actually manufacture uh, care packages for the United States uh, Army and uh, the Red Cross during World War I. So uh, some, some fun pictures from Haverford and, and Swarthmore. Uh, jumping forward, uh, we got a picture over here of the of the monthly meeting from at some point in the in the last ten or, or so years, and the yearly meeting. Um, throughout the uh, the middle of the the past century, um, costs began to grow exponentially uh, for monthly meeting friends of Philadelphia. Uh, obviously, with the construction of the new wing, things were going to get even more expensive. The property was huge. Um, burials had ceased, but the property was, you know, a, a, a large um, pull on obviously the, the funding that the meeting had. And so it was transferred uh, via Friends Fiduciary Corporation uh, to um, be under the operations of the Philadelphia yearly meeting to begin to soften some of the financial uh, blow that, um, that it really takes to maintain a huge historic uh, property like um, uh, Arch Street. Now, uh, some of you might have questions about deeds and things of that nature. I don't know much about that, actually. Um, that's a, a yearly meeting question. Uh, but regardless, the yearly meeting was now saddled with the responsibility of um, operating, funding, maintaining uh, the physical plant of the meeting house, the burial ground, the parking lot, et cetera. Uh, and costs over the last 40 or 50 years, again, have grown exponentially. Um, so kind of like how the monthly meeting decided that there needs to be a transfer of um, some operations to a different organization, um, mainly for funding purposes, uh, the yearly meeting recognized that fact too, that um, Arch Street Meeting House is such a huge um, cost <laughs> Uh, to maintain and to preserve, there needs to be a separate entity and a separate entity primarily for the purposes of fundraising because the yearly meeting cannot fundraise in the way that the Preservation Trust can. 
a separate organization that can fundraise for the preservation and operations of the meeting house. Uh, and so a, a standing committee was established. It could be in the 80s or perhaps the 90s. And they took um, you know, almost 15 years to decide what are we going to do? Uh, what model are we going to use? Uh, and that is where they looked at a bunch of other models um, which already existed in, in uh, Old City uh, and in Philadelphia. And it's a, an exceedingly common uh, practice among religious houses of worship, uh, congregations. Uh, you know, th this is not a problem that exists solely for Arch Street. It's a problem that exists with every house of worship in the United States. Um, you know, the, the congregation or the diocese don't have the fundings to support it. And so the, the individual church or the diocese establish some type of preservation organization um, to help maintain the, the building. So here's just a couple of examples. We've got historic St. George's right up the street, um, historic Old Swedes uh, in South Philly, and then obviously Christ Church around the corner from, from Arch Street. Uh, and there are hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands of organizations exactly like this, that um, the goal is to preserve the meeting house, preserve a church, uh, but also they take on a bunch of operation operational responsibilities. So most of these um, churches also have a uh, public facing role. Christ Church obviously operates both as a place of worship, but also as a museum, as does uh, Old Swedes, as does uh, Historic St. George's, most historic churches, of course, nowadays that have um, such an important history also serve that, um, that public facing, uh, public programs, operations, tours, etc. So uh, the yearly meeting um, and the standing committee within the yearly meeting looked at these models and said, okay, it works at every other house of worship in the country, it, it, it should probably work here as well. So that's how they established um, the Arch Street Meeting House Preservation Trust. Obviously, they were doing this on Quaker time, so it took a lot longer, perhaps, than some other um, religious organizations uh, took to, to bring about it. But the Preservation Trust itself was established in 2011 and then had full um, uh, independence in terms of raising funds by 2014. Um, but it's important to note we are designated by the IRS as a support organization. We still take um, uh, 501c3 donations, we can take EITC funding, we can take state preservation grants, federal preservation grants, um, but we are still technically a support organization established by PYM. So there is still, um, a, still some connection to the yearly meeting. For instance, we are not allowed to appoint our own board of trustees. That is done through admin council. Um, our committee processes all go through admin council. So it's a little different than your traditional preservation trust organization. The, um, the Christ Church Preservation Trust, for instance, they operate completely outside of the jurisdiction of the Episcopal Diocese of Philadelphia and the congregation itself that meets at Christ Church. Whereas obviously our street meeting house preservation trust is much more uh, interwoven within the yearly meeting itself. And obviously I'm, I'm presenting to you right now. So we're more interwoven with the monthly meeting than a lot of other preservation trusts um, and, and organizations that operate those type of buildings uh, would be in a normal setting. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, the, the number one thing that we do is fundraising. Um, it's a huge cost to operate the building. Uh, I know it. Um, the last time I presented at meeting for business in November, um, you know, Craig had a lot of questions about our budget. Uh, you know, generally speaking, this is roughly how the math breaks down every year, give or take, um, you know, a couple, a couple of grand every year. So generally the yearly meeting provides about $240,000 in general fund operations, which primarily goes to, to annual maintenance and the maintenance staff themselves. Uh, the Arch Street Meeting House Preservation Trust provides approximately $250,000 to $150,000 in operation funding. That provides um, funding for the staff that you see at the front desk. Uh, Jen from Visitor Services, Kayla handling communications uh, and membership, and uh, Ariana, the, the site manager. 
and the Arch Street Meeting House Preservation Trust uh, funding is primarily through the annual fund, which is a, a, an appeal that we put out every year and we raise about $75,000 or so. Uh, and that's unrestricted, thank goodness, which primarily goes to staff support. Uh, and then the remainder of that funding is grants, primarily through state, federal, or local organizations. And there has been some recent, uh, you know, uh, uh, philanthropic organizations that are not state um, or federal organizations. And so th that's an area, the annual fund and the grants uh, are, are an area that we're really trying to grow in because uh, we're only, you know, an organization that's 11 years old. And so we really haven't had the time to expand to the to the place that we would like to be to make it sustainable, uh, because the PYM number that two hundred and forty thousand dollars. The goal, of course, of the yearly meeting is to not pay two hundred and forty thousand dollars every year. Um, that represents almost their entire annual fund, uh, which is then just rerouted back to Arch Street. And obviously, there's one hundred and fifty uh, Quaker meetings within the yearly meeting. And they don't want to, you know, they want to be able to offer programs to all of those um, other monthly meetings rather than um, funding so much of our streets operations. So our goal, the Preservation Trust goal, is to raise the money to replace the PYM funding. So we would eventually have to bring in, you know, five hundred and fifty or six hundred thousand dollars to make the operation of the meeting house run effectively uh, and smoothly. Uh, so that's the task that PYM has set to me, which is to raise funding uh, to make sure the operations uh, move smoothly. Then that, separate from that, there's an additional $100,000 budget, which comes from the PYM Capital Reserve Fund, uh, which is solely for capital improvements at the building. And that's $100,000 a year that the property committee primarily uh, decides what needs to get done, uh, what needs to get, get repaired. Sadly, more often than not, um, we're not kind of deciding what, what gets repaired. It's, uh, it's like, oh, a, a system broke. We have, to, we have to replace this thing because the city code requires it, or uh, we're legally uh, not allowed to operate the building at all without X, Y, and Z. Or like the lights are beginning to disintegrate. We need to update the lighting. So we would love to have more projects that we can choose what, what we get to do. But more often than not, it's kind of um, out of desperation. We have to use that $100,000 for X, Y, uh, and Z. Uh, upcoming capital projects for sure are um, finishing the lighting in the West Room. Obviously, the East Room is done. Uh, a general electrical up update uh, part um, you know, throughout the whole building. It's a bit of a mess everywhere. And so updating those electrical systems. The boiler is. Um, 15 years past the point it was supposed to stop working. So that's gonna be a huge um, amount of, of work um, and probably adding air conditioning or updating the current air conditioning system, adding fire suppression to the building, uh, stormwater management. Uh, we're beginning to erode sections of the burial ground uh, and obviously just general preservation work. If I was to lump in all of those projects and we were to do them all in one year, it would probably cost somewhere in the range of $15 million or so to do all of that. So we'll probably have to do it in phases. There'll be a, um, you know, a desperation phase, which is the boiler um, and the fire suppression system. Uh, and then we'll, we'll add the lighting, the electric, stormwater management and preservation as more funding uh, is raised. So that's one section of what we do, which is the, the fundraising side of things. Uh, the other side of things is operations, which is um, making sure that the building is open to the public uh, at some point throughout the year. Uh, that's nothing new, actually. The, the building has operated as a public-facing kind of museum. I'm going to use the term museum, even though some people I know would prefer we, us not use the term museum. The public doesn't, doesn't understand the difference, so we use the, the term museum to make it clear to the public what we are, um, that they can visit the institution. If we say meeting house, they generally get really confused. Most visitors have no clue what a meeting house is. They think we're a conference center. And so it's really important to make sure that visitors know, we're, no, we're, we're not a conference center. We're, we're a historic site. I know that's more confusing for some visitors. So we're gonna say museum, but we're also an active place of worship. And so a lot of times you'll see um, us say museum and active place of worship. 
historic or Quaker historic site and burial ground. That's kind of the full designation I would give us. Um, and that just makes it clear to the, to the general public who's never heard of Quakers or have never heard of a meeting house, kind of what we are and what they should expect when they come to visit the property. So open to the public. That's, that's kind of a mission that's been around since the 1920s. The building has operated as a um, as a tourist attraction since the, the mid 1920s. Uh, there's traditionally it was volunteers who were making sure the building was open to the public. Uh, and so tour groups would come in throughout the 1930s, the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. And obviously in the 2000s is when we began to talk about we need an actual organization to run the tours to make sure we're consistent with what the National Park Service says we should be trying to do. So open to the public is one. Field trips is another. Um, uh, at the bottom of my, or at the end of this presentation, there are some numbers about our visitation and, and field trips are a huge part of, of what we do. Public programs, those are programs that talk uh, about the meeting house, the burial ground, Quaker history, the history of the monthly meeting. So we try and provide a, a well-rounded schedule of public programs that are interesting to a wide variety of individuals, people who live in the neighborhood, uh, Quaker historians, uh, obviously Quakers throughout PYM, members of the monthly meeting. We try and provide a, a well-rounded a well uh, calendar every year. Uh, rental programs, that's one of the um, areas of the operation that we inherited from PYM. Uh, they obviously had a huge rental program back in the 90s and the 80s and 70s. And um, so we've, we've taken on that and it's been a huge challenge for, for us because obviously we only have so much time in the day. And so to also run a, a rental program is really challenging. So we're gonna be evaluating how we can best do that in the future. Um, but obviously that, that's, a, that's a big part of PYM's budget, which is the rental income that they get. Um, from having programs at Arch Street. And, and we actually are the ones that, that are tasked with facilitating those rentals. Uh, so that is a bit of a challenge, but we're, we're working on it for sure. Uh, and then facilitating the maintenance programs and, and capital projects, which is a huge part of what I do. Uh, I would love to spend more time on fundraising, but I spend an enormous amount of time on understanding uh, what actually needs to be done in terms of preservation and maintenance in the building. Uh, last Friday, I spent two hours with Gary and Stefan tracking a wire through the sub-basement, trying to figure out where it goes and is it a problem? Uh, and luckily it wasn't, but I spent way too much of my time, sadly, tracking down these kind of um, really interesting uh, maintenance issues that have, you know, kind of been added on and added on and added on over the past um, uh, 70 or 80 years since electricity was introduced into the building and trying to make sure we're, we're within um, regulation and, and operating safely so that um, you all and the general public can, can enjoy the building. Uh, so those are kind of the two largest sections of what the Preservation Trust itself does, which is fundraising and of course, all these operational responsibilities as well. Uh, and then here are just some, some general numbers. I'd say these numbers have been pretty consistent uh, for probably 40 years, honestly, I, I, I had the joy of discovering a box of visitor files from the 1980s a couple of weeks ago, and we're about, we're about at what these numbers um, were then. So we're, we're normally visited by about 30,000 visitors a year. Most of them are non-Quakers, have never heard of Quakerism, and are in Philadelphia to visit uh, Independence Hall and the Liberty Bell. And they stop by the Betsy Ross house and they see our building and they say, oh, Quakers, right? Didn't they found Pennsylvania? Sure, let me check it out. And so they come in and they hopefully learn something about Quaker history and what Quakerism is. Uh, and that's primarily most of our visitors, which is um, uh, either school tours that have never, you know, it's part of their curriculum that they need to learn about Quakerism. So they come here to learn about it uh, or visitors from around the world or the United States who have never heard of Quakerism. So that's why, um, that's why we are trying to kind of lean into that term museum because most people don't understand what a meeting house is. So we're trying to make it more clear. This is a place for them to learn about Quakerism, learn about what a monthly meeting is. Um, and hopefully we're doing a, a vaguely good job in, in that regard. Um, the mission statement of the, of the Board of Trustees, of course, is to make this the main destination in the country for people to learn about Quakerism and Quaker history. So we're hoping that um, you know, with our expanding exhibits, more people will come 
and they'll learn about you all, the monthly meeting, they'll learn about the quarterly meeting, the yearly meeting, what Quakerism is, what the legacy of Penn and the Philadelphia monthly meeting has been. Uh, we're, we're hoping that this is like a driving force for people because if they're gonna come to visit the city and they're gonna hear about Quakerism, we hope that they come here and not learn about it at uh, Independence Hall or B Benjamin Franklin's house in passing. We'd love for them to get a full, well-rounded history of what it is to be a Philadelphia Quaker. Um, and then just some brief numbers, you know, generally we bring in about $50,000 a year in rentals, 20,000 a year in visitor revenue, that those are walk-in tours, about 10,000 a year in school tour donations, and about 100,000 in grants every year. Those are, those are rough estimates for what the Art Street Meeting House Preservation Trust brings in. Obviously there's fluctuation, and uh, the past two years have been really hard to calculate from a budgetary standpoint. Uh, what we're going to be making, but those are those are some you know rough numbers looking at the past five or six years, year over year. That's generally about what we're bringing in. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and I hope I answered most of the questions that Lois um, thought would be of interest to to members. But uh, of course, happy to answer any additional questions about what. Um, people think we do as an organization and, and how our funding structure works, et cetera. Yeah, Craig. You said the trust can fundraise in ways that PYM can't, but what does that mean? I mean, what things can you do that PYM can't? Sure, so as a, as a religious organization, uh, PYM or a monthly meeting or the Roman Catholic Church um, aren't eligible for certain federal, state, or city uh, funding streams. So there are certain um, operation funding grants that are only um, allowed to be fundraised for via a nonprofit um, entity that is separate from a religious entity, because obviously the, the federal and state governments can't, can't fundraise for the benefit of a religious organization. Um, but we, we can, because we're here not to operate a religious organization per se, we're here to preserve a national historic landmark, which is different. So that's that's really uh, why it was, this model was chosen to make sure that we're not, um, or the, the yearly meeting wasn't pigeonholing them in to creating a, a, a basically the same organization, but it can't fundraise in the way that it needs to be able to fundraise so, to make sure that- So you can go can after government grants. Is, is there anything else that you can do that they couldn't, or is it just, the governmental separation primarily of church and state thing? Primarily it's that. There are some uh, Department of Education uh, requirements that it's really important to be a non-religious organization. Uh, for instance, our, our, uh, the EITC funding. Uh, the goal of that program is to educate uh, fourth graders generally. That's, our, that's our, how we're interpreting it um, about Quaker history but we're, we're not doing it with a religious bent. We're here to talk about the history of Quakerism, how Pennsylvania was founded, et cetera. And so from a department, both a Pennsylvania and a federal Department of Education standpoint, uh, that was another primary reason uh, to have this operation model. That's a good, good question though, yeah, for sure. Any other questions? So how many, I'm oh, sorry, well, how, how many do donors do you get? So generally speaking, we get about 280 or so donors a year. Um, so not not huge, not where we'd want to be. Um, I think we're going to see uh, PYM has been a little um, reluctant to you know give, give us access to to some of their donor information. So hope, we're, we're really trying to be our our own separate organization, fundraising in our own way. So I think as we find our feet um, and, uh, you know, we're only 11 years old. I think as we find our feet, we'll, we'll hopefully attract more national donors. That's really the goal. Uh, preservationists who understand like, oh, this building is really important. There's only a handful of uh, Quaker meeting houses in the world that are as important as this one. And we should be funding it to a, to a much higher level. So hopefully we'll, we'll see that as we continue to expand. I will say the annual fund has, um, added at least a third in the last two years, which is great. So we're, we were probably at 100 and, 
you know, 90 donors um, in 2019, and now we've, we've surpassed that by a, a good margin. So uh, looking forward to continuing to expand. Um, what are you doing about um, making uh, the building green? So the, the biggest thing is to transition us off of steam. Uh, we are still using steam power, which is, in my, in my opinion, ridiculous. Uh, really efficient at heating the building, making it very, very warm, but not efficient to run. Uh, and so the goal would be to transition to a much greener um, source uh, soon. So currently, we're one of the capital budget projects this year was to undertake a, a survey of the boiler and, and what to do, essentially. Uh, I know we've talked about uh, geothermal, we've talked about solar. Um, it's a challenge, uh, both from the federal government, obviously the Department of the Interior regulates how what we can do on the property, um, as does the Philadelphia Historic Commission. Uh, and so th they're gonna kind of be the, the deciders of what is legally allowed. Um, Tom, I should say that the makeup of the property committee, uh, which begins the process of, of exploring these is, um, is threefold. There are members of the monthly meeting, uh, which is Tom Unkerfer and Heath Myers. Uh, then there's a representative of PYM in, uh, in the form of Linnell McCurry, who's the Associate Secretary for Business and Finance. Uh, then representing the trust is Lucy Strackhouse, who's a board member and the clerk of that committee. And then uh, myself, Gary and Stefan sit on there to report to the committee saying, oh, we have this huge issue that we need to fix. Um, so the committee is undertaking that process right now to evaluate what is the best option. Obviously, the geothermal project at Cherry Street did not really go according to plan. Uh, and it is further complicated because of the burial ground. Uh, there are real issues um, about having a geothermal um, project on top of a burial ground. We're not exactly sure what we'd find. Uh, and then as soon as you hit something, there are huge um, preservation um, interests at play, that, that would be really challenging. Solar, of course, uh, is another option, but of course the, the federal government regulates uh, the physical property itself, the, the plant, and so the roof is uh, outlawed. Uh, we could potentially do something in the parking lot, um, but I think that's, we're, we're just going to have to wait to see what the actual cost estimates are for each one. The, the most logical choice would be to transition us to hot water uh, and then get the air conditioning installed in the east and west rooms and have those run on really high efficiency um, air conditioning units. Um, and we can pick obviously the, the supplier for that power. We could pick solar or, or wind turbines and it would just be routed through PICO. Um, so I think there's a couple of different options. I don't have an answer exactly. I think the engineers are gonna to have to tell us what actually is feasible, but definitely something that's on my, on my mind. Um, a more pressing perhaps issue is the, the burial ground itself, the erosion of the burial ground. We're dumping um, thousands of gallons of water uh, into the streets actually, because the mains can't handle the property. Um, the, you know, the mains were, are, are three inches smaller than the city code requires. And so the mains are overflowing on the property and then dumping water um, onto the burial ground, eroding the, the burial mounds and then pouring it out into the street. Um, so we're not helping the water department at all with the sheer volume of dirt uh, that's cascading out into the grounds um, and then onto the street, but also not helping our, our very historic burial mounds, which are a, you know, a, a really fascinating asset. Um, so that's, that's almost more concerning. Um, to, to me to a certain degree from a, from a green standpoint because we're, we're burdening the water department with all this excess runoff. So um, we're, working, we're working on a grant right now with the water department to address that issue. So hopefully we'll see some movement. I'm, I, I'm, always, um, I'm always puzzled that you don't collect the water. There must be some subtle ways of collecting water. I, I, know, I know these, uh, these beautiful um, houses in England, these massive places, that's what they do. They collect the water and they so they use their own water. But that's that's something that I've noticed. On a rainy day, the water just you know is wasted. It's just <laughs> that that is that's actually the point of the the water department grant we're, we're applying for, which would be to uh, retain the water on the property itself. 
Yeah. Uh, and yeah. that's that's the way the water department would fund the project. They'll only fund projects that keep water on your property. Good. Uh, so that's, <laughs> that's a that's very good. That's very good news. Yes. So definitely it, it, that I mean the water department involved, it's gonna take a while, but we're definitely something that we're addressing um, and trying to move forward as quickly as possible. Yeah. Okay. I, I have some more questions, but I think Lois wants one first. Sure. When you say that the Art Street Meeting House is a museum, what kinds of historic artifacts are you currently showing? Are there any others that you'd like to show in the future? What are the plans in terms of museum? Sure. So obviously we have those, those old kooky um, displays from the 1970s, which was really the last time the, the quote unquote museum area of the, of the Meeting House was was uh, redone. I think the previous time was probably in the 40s, maybe that, that the museum galleries were were overhauled. But so we, we're, we've taken a stab at doing some stuff. Uh, and we'll probably take another stab in about four years from now when we get some solid fundraising in, in place. But right now on display, we've got the uh, burial sled, which is a fascinating, I think it's the, pro I've never seen one like it in, in all my research. Uh, it's a really fascinating piece. Um, and we just found actually room, uh, the casket display case, which is really cool, which is where you put the, the caskets themselves for, for display. So we have a bunch of burial ground um, artifacts, um, a decent number of artifacts about the construction of the building itself, uh, such as the uh, tools that, that Biddle used. I know those were on display about a decade ago, but we just got those out of the collection and are displaying them again. Um, and that's really, that's, that's what the artifacts that are on display. We have a lot of text, obviously, in the East Room. I think our exhibits are probably a little text heavy. Um, I'm not sure we technically meet the requirements that the department uh, or the National Park Service would say, which is, you know, only 75 words. We really drone on a lot. Uh, and so we're working to update that, um, those text boxes to make them a little smaller and have more on display so that people can actually see uh, all the artifacts that we have in the in the uh, vault. Yeah, Nancy. Um, what what do you mean? You just found the coffin display case. It was just it was up behind a bench upstairs. I feel like no one um, no one knew it was there. Is it um, is it plexiglass or? No, no, it's it's wood. Probably dates. We we're trying to. It's wood pegs, so I'm imagining it dates probably from the 1750s, 60s, something like that. Wow. You should, yeah. Yeah, yeah. When next time you're in, I'll take you up there. It's a really cool piece. Okay. I'm assuming the the people before me assumed it was just a table of some kind that was broken down, but Ariana obviously is a former director at a um at a funeral parlor. Was like, no, no, that this is a oh, this like a eighteen. This is an eighteenth century coffin display case. Like we should really do something about that. And I'm like, oh my god. I've never actually looked behind this bench before. I'm glad I did because this is a really interesting. Because you know, most churches that you would go to, you'd see really elaborate uh, coffin uh, carriages and and bears and so forth. But of course, you know, the Quakers are not going to have that, and so ours are really simple, um, you know, tools that are that are there for a, pur a purpose. They're not there to be ornate. They're there to get the job done. Um, and so I've I've really never seen one. Uh, like it before. It's really fascinating. Wow. Yeah, Eric. Sean, have you found any artifacts from the Underground Railroad era? Oh. There, we have a ton of, um, or a decent amount of, of clothing from the from that time period, uh, but no specific artifacts. Uh, related to the Underground Railroad itself. We have a, a manumissions document, which is fascinating, which lists a bunch of manumissions that occurred, but I believe it predates the Underground Railroad period. I think it's from uh, the 1810s or the, or the 1790s, around about there. Um, I mean, most of the, the weird thing is most of the collection, most of the paper collection, I should, I should say, much like the monthly meeting records that were stored in the vault were all transferred to Haverford, um, you know, throughout the 90s, the 2000s. Um, and so we have, we really, we, we don't have much paper record anymore, which is a shame, although we can access it from Haverford at 
at any point that we want. Um, it, we, we more have, you know, family heirlooms that people have passed down um, or artifacts from, from the, the building itself. Um, it's, you know, many iterative changes through its design and, and construction and, and so forth. And, the tombstones, I wish we had more tombstones. We have a couple of them in the in the basement, but the minutes of the property committee from uh, 1760 or so, they say that most of them were actually buried in a large pit on the property. So they're they're there somewhere. They're just in a pit somewhere out on the property. So sadly, we don't have many of them, but um, the ones that we do have are, are really fascinating uh, testament to uh, you know, Quaker grave markers, which is really fascinating. Any other um, questions? Do you, do you have any idea of anyone who's buried there, though? I mean, do you know? Oh yeah, the, the records are pretty pretty clear. Um, we we don't have a firm number. We, I think low estimates are around thirteen thousand. High estimates are around twenty thousand. Um, and we have decent minutes actually for most of the burials that that took place. Um, but there, of course, were, were, were members um, or were, were people who were not members of the monthly meeting who were buried there. And that's the challenge. Um, uh, regular people who were buried during the yellow fever epidemic or at other points throughout its changing history. Uh, and those records are not terribly clear. So low, low estimates are 13, high estimates are 20. But yeah, any, we've got a ton of um, people's, people's names uh, uh, of, you know, with uh, from from meeting members, for, for sure. You know, I'm sure if I had the full list of who was in the monthly meeting, we could comb through and say, oh, we've got a bunch of great, 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 great grandfathers and grandmothers buried in the in the burial ground, which is fascinating. No, I, I, I of course expect that you know the um, AAMP pretty well. It's just down the street. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, they have, of course, these um, stories of, mm -hmm. uh, which is, it, it's a, it's an interesting way of um, of explaining the past. I'm not for a minute suggesting you you do the same thing, but what I am what I am thinking is, um, yeah, I've been a Quaker for thirty years. My ancestors were Quakers in Ireland um, from 1690. Um, but what I've what I've known in the 31 years of being a Quaker in Philadelphia is there are a lot of really amazing people. Um, and some are still living today. So rather than going back there, I mean, having a, you know, I, I, I wouldn't really know how to, how to uh, present that, but um, it would be really interesting to have some stories about people who are, who in Philadelphia have, um, have, have made, made a big difference. I suppose two people I could think of right immediately are um, Henry Cadbury and Rufus Jones, who won the Nobel Prize for, um, um, AF, for AFSC in 1946, I believe. Well, they came out of Philadelphia yearly meeting. Um, and they're ours, you know, they don't belong to AFSC, they're, they belong to us. Um. Sean, uh, were you planning to have what we call the what our reception room um, for us to use to tell stories like that? Is that yeah, something? so the the idea is that the East Room, you know, it's always been a place for exhibits, or at least from the you know nineteen twenties or so onwards. And so, you know, those exhibits were were trying to curate uh, to make sure that we give visitors a, a well-rounded. Okay, here's the founding of Pennsylvania through to today, uh, but then the reception room is, is a place really for the monthly meeting. We'd love to have exhibits talking about what you do historically, but what you do right now as well. You know, a place for you to recruit and a place for you to talk about what the monthly meeting does. Um, and so yeah, having exhibits that, that speak to that and having information about the meeting in the reception room, I think is really, is a really a good use of that space because then as visitors walk around the building, that's they're about to walk into your your actual space, and so it makes sense that they interact with with that content right there, and then they head into the monthly meeting room and they they sit down and they have a think, and so yeah, that that's the goal. And so if there are stories like that from meeting members um, uh, or, or other things that the meeting wants to include within the narrative that we're trying to tell, that's perfect. And and let me know, <laughs> and if I can find a grant, I'll try and write 
write it so we can get the funding to do it. Mm -hmm. Wow, which brings brings me to another point. Um, the library. You yep. know, we've got these beautiful new shelves. Every time I look at them, I just gush. I just can't yeah. believe how beautiful they are. And, and of course, Heath organized all that. Mm -hmm. um, I've been a little slow of putting all the books together because there's no one there. Um, what I'm, I'm hoping, I volunteered for a while at PYM Library, and it's just not working. There's no support from PYM itself for the library. Well, there's a little, but there's almost nothing. There's no one paid to run the library. That's the issue that I'm talking about, support. Um, and the people who are, who are volunteering, they're good people, they try very hard. But there's only so much you can do when you're um, volunteering once or twice a week. Um, I would like the, um, the books. You know, I, I've been, um, I've been catalog cataloging them and um, hopefully at some stage I, I'll, I'll finish that before too long. Um, with the idea of having the books as part of a reading room. So in other words, have, have a couple of hours a week or a couple of days, couple, a few hours a week, where people can just sit down and read. Um, we, we ca it cannot be a library, a lending library, because we don't have the personnel. And that's the last thing you need to be doing, <laughs> it's running after library books. Um, but it's, that's the nice thing. I mean, books are, are so Quaker and, and so slow. I mean, you can just sit down and read. And, and maybe with the new kitchen, uh, they can have a cup of coffee or something. I mean, it, it, it seems, I, I, I'm willing to help in any way I can with that, but I, I, there's just such fabulous books too. And this is, this is another thing too. I mean, you can tell so much when you're walking around and, and um, listening to a guide, but you can really learn by sitting and reading some of these books by these Quakers and uh, other people. Yep. Uh, they're, they're, it's, 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 it's a really wonderful resource. And I'm, I'm really hoping it can, I would actually like the library to be moved from Cherry Street into Arch Street, which would <laughs> freak you out imme immensely, but to be used as a reading room. Hmm. I mean, they're, well, they're, they're, they're just swamped. They, they're just swamped there. And it's not accessible. Well, it's a, it, yeah. it, it, it would be great. It would be great to have that, those li that library accessible and maintained. Um, I think I think it's I think anything like that would be down the road at the moment. Oh yes, no, um, I'm 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 talking out of my hat at the moment. <laughs> but I mean, at the at the moment, though, with those beautiful four bookcases, which are gorgeous, would yeah, filled, and they'll be filled with books that I've um, that, that have been donated from all over the place. Mm -hmm. Friends Journal. There's a, a complete collection of Friends Journal, which is really nice. Um, can I, um, can I, I have a, a question on a different subject. May, sure. I, may I interrupt here? Um, what, do you have any projection for the number of visitors we may get in the future, particularly now that we're, we seem to be coming to the end of COVID or, you know, the end of the pandemic? Um, do you have any projections on that or? Well, we had, um... In, in 2020, the summer of 2020, when we briefly reopened, uh, we had uh, about 1,200 visitors that summer. Uh, and then when we reopened this summer, we had, um, well, from calendar year, um, rather than fiscal year, we had 17,223 or something like that. Wow. Pretty good, I would say. So I'm anticipating um, when, when we're back to full capacity, Mm -hmm. uh, we'll get back to that 30,000 number pretty mm -hmm. fast. Interesting, the 17,000 number was without field trips, which traditionally makes up mm -hmm. half of our visitorship. So yeah. we exceeded our highest number of walk-in visitors this year without field trips, which was interesting. Mm -hmm. And it was a pretty bad year, I would say, overall for yeah. visitors yeah. to the city. So I'm anticipating um, now that we have real hours um, mm -hmm. that we're going to have more visitation. I, I I, I think the, the hours that we had beforehand, which was like 1 to 3.30 or 11 to 1.30, wasn't accessible to the general public. You know, if you look at every other historic site, 
um, you know, Christ Church down the street, they operate on a 10 to 4 schedule, uh, particularly during the summer. They, you know, visitors are expecting to show up and visit your historic site at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, so our goal is, you know, the summers will be open Wednesday um, to Sunday, 10 to 4 for visitors, walk-ins, etc. Anyone can come into to the space. Obviously, during meeting for worship, we we close down the reception room so that random people aren't walking in into that space. But you know, we want to we want to make sure that we're being consistent with what other historic houses of worship are doing, which is generally 10 to 4. You know, some some sites that have smaller staffs than us that might only have one person that works the whole the whole facility, they might be open a little less. But we're we're really trying to be accessible to the general public when when they want that. What do the docents do? The docents um, generally are in the West Room. Uh, in the past, we had two types of docents. We had a, a docent who sat at the, the front desk, essentially the, the little guide desk, and then one docent that would be in the West Room. From a liability standpoint, we decided to get rid of the, the docent that was at the front desk. The idea of them handling money, um, and also like there, there are dangerous characters <laughs> out in the world. And we really want, from a liability standpoint, a staff member to be the first person that interacts with visitors. And then the docent can take over the, the historic experience and the religious experience about explaining what a Quaker is and the history of the building. So now you'll see, obviously, a staff person sitting at the front desk and a docent is in the West Room offering information and giving a, you know, mini tours. It's kind of up to the docent. They can kind of make it what they want it. Uh, to be if they just want to answer facts they can answer facts but some of our docents give like a full 20 minute presentation at the sounding board for instance so uh it, you know mignon has her style and, and everyone else has their uh, individual style that they they like to bring to the experience to to make it entertaining and exciting for the visitors that that come in oh okay <laughs> Little thing. I, okay, I um I want to talk about the twenty seventh of um, February because uh, sure. at adult education on that day, one p.m. is me taking a tour, uh, giving a tour of the trees in the grounds, and um, I'm a quick study, but at the moment I don't really know what all the trees are. I have to get there and photograph everyone. And the, 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 the idea is an intergenerational um, first day school where we get, uh, hopefully we'll get some kids and kids will all adopt a tree. And then during the rest of the year, sort of watch it bud and do all kinds of things. The trees are really gorgeous. They're just so beautifully maintained. So um, does anyone know anything about the trees? Gary and Stefan might. I know we we walk around every um, spring with John Studley from Bartlett, who does the the tree pruning, and he knows so much. He he just he tells me this, that, and the other thing. And by the end of it, I'm like, oh god, I think one of these is an elm, maybe. But I, you you talk so fast, I'm not exactly sure. Um, so I I I would see if Gary and Stefan know something, but I I wouldn't be yeah, entirely certain that they do. Okay, so what, what I really need is a map of the trees, and you're saying that exist? <laughs> I, I'll ask to, uh, John, I think he did a site inventory of the trees five or six years ago. I can see if I, he has a copy of that, he can send it. That would, be, that would be marvelous. And of course, everyone is, is invited. I mean, this is, um, we're not charging because it's adult education, but I, I, I don't quite know how you handle that with um, tourists that, wander in or we generally we've tried to keep things consistent with what Christchurch does which is uh, five dollars I know for a long time it was two dollars but it's just a suggested donation Christchurch has a hard ticket price ticket and we have a soft you know if someone just wants to give us a dollar that's fine if they don't want to pay that's fine um, but we had a pretty good year you know people as soon as you say oh five dollars suggested donation they're like oh what's what is this going for? And we're like, well, for all these things, we're trying to support the burial ground and this and that and the other thing. And they're like, oh my God, this is, a, of course we'll pay $5. We'll give you $10. Absolutely. So um, yeah, we, we. Yeah, that's what they do in, in Oxford. I was in Oxford two years ago and um, they were, they were really, 
they passed around the hat. They made it quite clear that they needed donations and everyone coughed up. I mean, just a few dollars. And, uh, you know, you, you feel good when you're, when you're paying for something that- Absolutely. But it, it makes sense, you know? Now our field trips, the, the, the schools that book with us in advance, that's like a hard ticket price because we, we have like a full program we do with them. You know, there's a walking tour component. There's a this, there's that. They're going to use the bathrooms. They're going to be doing this. So it's it's like a field trip that if they were getting a tour of, of any historic site, um, that's a hard ticket price um, that we have. But there are school groups that just show up without telling us and they come in and they say, yeah, we're just checking it out. We don't have any cash. And we just, you know, we let them explore on their own and if they have any questions they can ask us so we we really try we don't try to put a barrier to access to the to the building but we try and um, you know make funding happen when we can if possible now do you go out to any schools or i mean are you sort of sitting in arch street all the time or are you going out and uh, talking to groups so i i do a lot of presentations at quaker continuing life community uh, organizations but Jen and Kayla kind of oversee the field trip booking situation. So they're, they're reaching out to schools and saying, hey, you know, I know it's spring and this is when you're learning about Quaker history in Pennsylvania. Uh, do you want to come on a field trip uh, at our street meeting house? Um, and they say yes or no, or actually you want to Zoom with our class? Do you want to come out and give a presentation? So we're, we're pretty flexible. We want to meet the school wherever they're, wherever they're at. Um, but traditionally we're centered kind of on Phil the Philadelphia School District Lower Bucks, you know, Eastern Montgomery County, Northern Delaware County, um, the, you know, the local schools that it's not going to be a burden for them to get on a, on a bus and come out and visit us. So, but it wouldn't be a bad idea to um, put together a speaker series. I mean, sure. there's a lot of, there's a lot of very brilliant people connected to PYM who, I mean, for example, Mignon, I mean, she knows so much. Um, you know, I, I don't know if she's willing to go out and talk to people, but I mean, I'm, as an example of, of, of people. Um, well, I, I mean, it was one of the weird, uh, the weird mistakes, perhaps, that the Preservation Trust did, which was get rid of the speaker series about uh, six years ago. I think that was a really big, big mistake. And I'm trying to rectify that situation because it brought in a lot of money and it brought in a lot of interests and a lot of people from, you know, far out. Quaker meetings within PYM to come into the city and and they had that connection with the building and they got rid of that and I think that was a big mistake so I'm I'm working hard to get that back. Yeah, I, I would I would think you'd have a lot of support from some of the people at PYM without um, mentioning names. I mean, I because I know them. I mean, there's a couple of really good people there who who are very interested in um, keeping keeping friends going, which is really what all this is about. You know, we, we, want, we want the Religious Society of Friends to be around and be making care packages for soldiers and refugees yeah. in, in 100 years. Yeah. I mean, that's, in, in my mind, that's the core mission that we have. Although I'm, I'm tasked with fundraising and preservation, the core mission I have is for more people to know about Quakerism. And, the, the real issue is, is that most people don't know what it is. And the only place, if they're going to come and be a tourist in Philadelphia, the only place they're going to learn about that is right here at our street meeting house. So do you have someone who can put things, I mean, you know, we can all get, get information for you. I mean, I've done, I did quite a lot of reading on Rufus Jones and Henry Cadbury and their books are in, in the PYM library. I mean, these are, these are people that, I mean, there's this incredible story of Rufus Jones deciding that he wanted to feed all um, German kids. And he actually went to see Hitler with um, some other Quakers. And they, they had their meeting for worship right there in the ante room and, apparent, and Hitler agreed and they fed the kids. But, the, but they were feeding kids from 1917. And this was in the 1930s. Right. And then in 1945, of course, as soon as the war was over, um, packages were sent over. My, I had, my husband, my late husband was a German, um, was born in Germany in 1941 to a Jewish woman. So, I mean, they, they had a rough time. And, um, and his earliest memory, I, getting care packages from American Quakers. 
And uh, he was so grateful. I mean, all his life, so grateful for that. Extraordinary story. I mean, it, is, it, it really is. But then, and, and this, this story would be repeated again and again and again. Well, that, that part of that story might be part of our exhibit. Absolutely. Uh, and, maybe, and we can maybe think of it in terms not so much of exhibit, but actually telling our story. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I might use museum language, and, and, and that's only because my background is in public history. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm using this language because that's my background. But in reality, I want, I want the exhibits, if we're going to call them exhibits, mm -hmm. to be what you want them to be. It should be telling your story um, in, in that room. And so I'm, I'm going to use certain terms like museum, but it's a, it's oh, a Quaker historic that, site. And I'm yeah. you need. No, that's quite all right. I was, I was just thinking of it myself because I would say, exhibit but it's it's really much it's more to us than an exhibit so <clears throat> i was kind of changing my mindset as i was saying this sentence um yes, yes. sean yes. um i think this has really been great talking to you um really gave some hard facts about the trust in the meeting house but i think the second part talking about the exhibits and how you're planning to move forward and how we can be part of it um, was really important. Definitely. Well, I really appreciate the, the offer um, to speak with you. I really enjoyed it. And just a plug, I uh, will be presenting again at Meeting for Business next Sunday. Uh, and Kayla and Jen will be there as well. So hopefully I will, we'll, I'll be presenting specifically the, the new emergency um, plan, which is, you know, kind of best practice for a building to have to make sure we know what to do in case of an emergency. So I'll be presenting that to, to people so they know what to do in an emergency. Looking forward to seeing you all in person at some point to run a fire drill. Um, but uh, Jen and Kayla will also be there answering some questions about uh, some booking software that they're toying around with. Uh, and just so you can say, oh, that is Kayla and Jen who are behind the masks all the time. There, there we go, that's mm -hmm. what they look like. So um, we'll, be, uh, we'll be hanging around next Sunday with you all for a bit. Just before you leave, it just occurred to me, you know, we, um, we volunteer at the shelter down the street at 4th and, and Race. And the first thing you see when you walk into, into the churchyard is love first. Now, friends are all about love. I don't see love all over the, the I mean, Throw in some love. That's what I'd like. Especially, I'll try. that would be nice. That's that's one thing because I mean everything is about kindness, which is another word for love, and that's yeah. that's that's at the core of who we are. And um, yeah, you're doing it's great. It'll be nice when the kitchen's ready too. It'll be so nice. All the the grout went in uh, on Friday. So it's exciting. Uh, I've, I've lost more years off of my life because of this, teaching, as I'm sure you all have. You've, you've gone through it a lot longer. I've just inherited the project and I've really exhausted. I can't imagine how, how meeting members and, and everyone else involved in this has had to deal with it. So I, uh, waiting with bated breath, breath for that project to be done. Okay, thank you. Cool. Well, thank you. Sean, I'm going to turn off the recording now. <laughs>